Thank you all for coming to our Issue Mondays. These are our uh, monthly public lecture series where we tackle issues and hot topics and things of interest. Uh, in the spring, we dove into the U.S.-China relationships. Uh, we also did a panel discussion on doctor-assisted suicide, which is likely to be a ballot initiative this November. So uh, tonight is all about ed reform and what happened in Jeffco and what's happening in Douglas County and where are we going, what's moving forward, all that stuff. So very grateful that you all came out. My name is Jeff Hunt. I'm the director of the Centennial Institute. That's the think tank housed here at Colorado Christian University. You probably saw some news here recently. Um, our former president passed away in July, um, President Bill Armstrong. And just this last week, we appointed a new president, uh, Dr. Donald Sweeting, who will be uh, steering the ship as we move into a new chapter here at Colorado Christian University. It's a very exciting time to be here. We are about to welcome our largest uh, enrollment population ever in the history of the college this fall. So it is really just taken off. And th that is a testimony to uh, President Armstrong's leadership as well as the leadership of our board. And we have our board chair here, Gary Armstrong. So thanks so much for joining us. As you know, we're here to discuss education reform in Colorado. But before we begin, I want to recognize a new school that just opened down the street, very important school for ice cream man, called Sunday School. How about the School for Giants? Anyone heard of the School for Giants? High school? There you go. You're getting it now. How about, how about the school for surfers? Anyone know what that's called? Boarding school? All right, one more, one more, one more. King Arthur's new school. Night school. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. Well, after the school board recall losses in Jefferson County, the current turmoil with the Douglas County School Board, recent voucher cases and the growth of charter schools and challenges over statewide testing and Common Core, what's next for education reform in Colorado? What are the issues confronting parents like myself? And how do we continue to improve school choice, the quality of our local schools and the experience of our administrators and teachers? As many of us prepare to send our children back to school this fall, and my kids will be in the Douglas County School Board system starting tomorrow morning, um, we're grateful to have three experts here with us to help us think through these issues. And we'll start with my, on my left is Dean Deborah Scheffel. She's the Dean and Professor of Education at Colorado Christian University right here. She's a State Board of Education member representing Colorado's 6th Congressional District. Then we have Brad Miller. Brad is a lawyer and counsel for large school districts here in Colorado and more than 20 charter schools. This included representation of the Jeffco and Thompson school boards from 2013 until December of 2015. And then finally on my left is Pam Benigno. She is the director of the Independence Institute's Education Policy Center and speaks both locally and nationally on K through 12 education issues. So please join me in welcoming our guests this evening. The way we're going to run this evening is I've asked each of them to prepare a statement for about 10 minutes on the kind of future of the ed reform movement in Colorado, issues that they're addressing and working on. Then I'll host a series of questions, and then finally we're going to turn it over to you all to ask questions towards the end. So um, hold your questions till then, but we're going to start with the dean of our school here, Deborah Scheffel. Thank you. Well, first of all, I'd like to just thank Jeff for his leadership and for the opportunity to be able to be on this panel with other great friends and also wonderful to see a number of friends in the audience and thanks to everybody for coming. I really appreciate it, the opportunity to talk about education. So I've been in education for a number of years, started out really as a special education teacher in Douglas County, uh, have been in a number of other states apart from Colorado doing teacher preparation and working in a number of contexts that touch on education. And of course, right now I'm at uh, Colorado Christian as their dean of the School of Education. So it's such an important um, leverage point, teacher quality. How are teachers prepared to work with our kids? How can we do that better? How well are we doing it in our state and in our nation? Uh, having served on the State Board of Education for the last almost six years, uh, I represent the 6th Congressional District, as Jeff said. Members can serve for up to two six-year terms gratis. And I've uh, really enjoyed the opportunity to serve the 6th CD. 
Uh, as I've been on the State Board for the last uh, almost six years, there are a number of issues that just continue to present themselves as really important for our state. I'm just going to list some of those and then we'll talk about the school choice piece, but really the school reform movement has a number of different facets of which school choice is one of them. And so one, of course, is this whole testing and accountability issue, and there's just been so much in the media about how much testing is right, what kind of assessments should we be having, uh, how much time do teachers spend uh, worrying about how well their students are going to do on the test as opposed to teaching uh, a knowledge domain and creating richness in the curriculum. So that's one really important issue. Another is the whole issue of, of privacy and big data. And so we all know that our privacy is regularly uh, invaded as we use cell phones and people are worried about identity theft. And in schools, it's uh, the same issue with respect to how our, what's happening to our kids' data. As teachers, for example, download apps and want to use them to practice multiplication facts, for example, how is that, where is that data? And kids are signing, you know, I accept <laughs> privacy statements as we do if we go to Kinko's, for example, and use their computer. It's like, do they know what they're accepting? So that whole issue of data is really so very important. Another one is the standards. We are up this year to review the standards. We have 10 sets of standards in Colorado, and they're up for review this year. We review them every so many years. And we'll likely do it in kind of a graduated fashion. But uh, as you know, Colorado in 2010 um, agreed to enter into accepting the Common Core standards. And those are just in two subject areas, in English language arts and math. So the question is, shall we continue that uh, relationship with Common Core? What are the implications of that? Of course, teachers have spent a lot of time aligning their curriculum with Common Core standards, which are really called Colorado Academic Standards because um, Colorado can put 15% of the standards uh, to be uh, unique to the state. Also, like Texas could adopt them, for example, and add Texas history. Colorado can do the same. So the question is, do we continue that way, or do we relook at the standards? And how good are the Common Core standards? Did that help us? Did that raise the bar? Did that lower the bar? Another is um, turnaround schools. Uh, legislation was passed and we have a certain subset of schools in our state which are um, underperforming and intractably so over a number of years. And so the law says that uh, if that's the case and the data is intractably flat or dropping, that the state needs to take action and do something so that we don't have certain kids perennially in low performing schools. And so. Um, a school can be taken over and become a charter. Some of the, uh, a certain proportion of the teachers can be let go. They can change leadership. A host of sort of extreme measures. Uh, is that a good thing? Should we be doing that? We're a local control state, one of very few states in the nation that are local control, which means we should be pushing power and influence to the local districts, 178 of them, as opposed to centralizing. And then, of course, ESSA, you know, you know the No Child Left Behind acronym, NCLB. Well, that's just been replaced uh, fairly recently with the Every Child Succeeds Act. Question, what is that about? We have to write a state plan in the next, I guess, nine months, and we're just assembling listening groups and focus groups to help write that plan. What's in that plan? How does it guide our state? What can we do about it to, again, push away from federal influence to local influence, where we're closest to the site of change, closest to the parents and the kids who are in the system itself. Another issue is online education and technology. How much of education should be online? Uh, is online a good genre for kids? What age? What kinds of subjects lend themselves to that type of delivery model? So that's a really important issue. Um, another is choice, of course, right? So we believe that if parents have options, we want them to be able to see where they live and draw a concentric circle around it and say, within this catchment area, how many options do I have if the neighborhood school isn't working? And for some parents, it's a lot. And for other parents, it's not a lot. And how does, how does that look? I know we have thousands of kids on waiting lists. I don't know the exact number, but last time I checked, it was like 69,000 kids in Colorado alone on waiting lists for charters. What does that mean about uh, kids not being in an optimal school, at least based on what their parents feel? they need. And of course, teacher quality, we mentioned that initially, and then workforce readiness. This is a big push that we're not globally competitive as a nation, and how can we have standards and expectations and test scores that uh, would reflect the fact that, yes, we are actually globally competitive, and that our kids are well prepared after they exit high school to move into a career or move into more post-secondary education. So those are some of the issues that are facing the state right now. All of them, in some way, touch on the whole reform movement. and. Um, you know, from my perspective, I like to, I like to really focus on, and the research bears this out, that teachers are the most important leverage point in terms of quality education. So do these reform initiatives uh, support that? Do they support teachers maximally? Can we 
can we uh, get influence locally as much as possible, particularly since it's written into our Constitution that we're a local control state, and can we support teachers so that they can be well supported to be the best influence on a child's education. And of course, parental rights and parental influence is crucial also, so that kids are educated, educated commensurate with the values and beliefs of, of parents. And that often doesn't happen either. And that's such an important leverage point, because in school, kids learn how to think about life. They make up their mind about life in school. They spend six to eight hours a day for 12 years in school. And if they're not learning the values and and uh, important uh, priorities that the family and the parents want, then that becomes a problem because where is that power situated? So thanks for the opportunity to just summarize some of what's going on in Colorado. Wow, there's a lot of work to be done, isn't there? <laughs> lots and lots of work. Uh, I, first, I want to introduce my two teammates. Ross Izzard, would you raise your hand? Ross is our senior policy analyst in the Education Policy Center. And Eric Valencia, right over there. He, uh, Eric is our coordinator for both Spanish and English communications and outreach in our Education Policy Center. And the three of us make up the policy, education policy at the Independence Institute. I'm a former teacher in Jeffco a long, long time ago, before kids, long time ago, homeschooling mom for six years. In the mid 80s, I became involved in an organization called Citizens for Excellence in Education, trying to organize parents. I see a lot of people in this audience that I know, a lot of old friends, but the oldest is sitting right here, Senator Lumberg. We met in the, we met in the, <laughs> I didn't mean it that way. Um, an old dear friend, a dear friend, we met in the late 80s, actually. So I was working on a ballot initiative um, for school vouchers way back then. Let me, let me start by just telling you a couple of fun facts that you might not know, first of all. John Andrews and Donna's brother, the late David Yevlin, actually founded the Independence Institute in 1985. In 1988, they held the Western, I'm looking at my notes so I get this right, the Western States Education Summit. Does that sound a little familiar? Mm -hmm. That was back in 1988, and there were representatives from 13 different states. And uh, Governor Romer was even there because I found a quote by uh, him in, a, I think, a Denver Post article or Rocky Mountain News. And he said, well, I, I, I might could support public school choice to a limited degree. They talked about Margaret Thatcher's school reform, I think it was Education Reform Act. Get it? <laughs> Education Reform Act. Back in 1988, they were talking about it. Well, here we are long time, long time ago. We're still talking about how to reform schools. We can't give up. It's going to take a long time. And you know what? We'll never get there. We'll never get there. 20, 30 years from now, we'll still be talking about reforming schools. There'll be something else involved. But every single student that attends the schools, all the public schools, the private schools, the home schools, they're all important. And if we can help children learn, even, you know, if it's a certain percentage of them, if we can make a difference, we keep working and working and working, and all three of us up here do that every day, trying to make things better. So we never, never, never want to give up. Back in 1970, the very first choice school opened in Colorado. Now, I'm not talking about a high school at-risk program for kids that are having trouble. I'm talking about for elementary kids, for you know, a little bit older kids, too. And it was, it was called Open Living School. Now it's the Jeffco Open School, I believe. Started back in 1970, and a group of parents, they wanted a different kind of program for their kids. They wanted a program that would educate the whole child, because in the 1960s, that was a new, a new thing in education. In 1973, Jefferson County School Board adopted a policy so that cr to create alternative schools. Do you realize how long ago that was? <laughs> it was 20 years later that the charter school law was passed. In 1974, another group of parents opened up 
Denison Fundamental School. They were on the ex other side of the whole child folks. They wanted back to the basics. They wanted a rigorous education. They wanted a lot of discipline in the classroom and whole group instruction, and by golly, you better teach them phonics, because back then, phonics were on their way out. So we have to have lots of different kinds of choices for lots of different kinds of kids. Parent involvement, though, that's very, very, very important. When it comes to our own children, we tend to be pretty involved. In fact, at Denison, which is just a few blocks from here, parents literally camped out overnight to get their children on the list. In fact, I remember when people used to say, on the way to, after you have your baby at the hospital, on your way home, you stop by Denison and put them on the waiting list. Some of you are laughing because you heard that too, I bet. There'll always be needs for, need for, for more reform, but we, we need to have more parents involved. Um, it was so exciting to see the school boards that turned over to the reformers over the past few years, and I know some of you are in this room that sacrificed a lot. But what I saw lacking was parents. We needed parents at the microphones. We needed parents, parents, parents on social media. There'll always be a steady stream on the opposition. They'll never stop. They'll always be there, and they'll always be well organized. So even though I was involved in organizing parents back in 1985 and 86 and 87, boy, I've got to get back at that again. We're trying to do that through social media now. I, I kind of feel like parents, we used to have meetings and bring in speakers and uh, back then, and we'd have a pretty good crowd. But I think nowadays people want to do more on social media. So Eric's running our uh, social media Facebook pages uh, in Spanish and English, School Choice for Kids. Hope you'll take a look. He's putting up lots of videos and trying to start a conversa conversation with parents, trying to do something new because there's such a need for it. Uh, another uh, thing I'd like to mention, and I agree with Dr. Scheffel's list. It's a long list. I'm just picking out a couple of things. And that's on private school choice. And that's where the Independence Institute, we really are experts on that. Um, I've been involved with private school choice movement, as I mentioned, since the 1980s. A project that we've been working on for the last three and a half years, I believe, is going to be the next expansion of private school choice in Colorado. As you probably know, back in 2003, Governor Owens signed a voucher law into um, into law, and it was struck down by the Colorado Supreme Court on a local control issue. A few years later, Douglas County, picking up on that court case, passed a program, adopted a program in their school district. And as you know, that program was struck down by the Colorado Supreme Court on other issues and is sitting before the U.S. Supreme Court now, waiting to be, we're hoping that they'll hear it. You know the circumstances as far as the death of... Um, Justice Scalia changed things quite a bit. We don't know what will happen. But there's another kind of program, which I mentioned we've worked on for three and a half years, and that's scholarship, or it's education scholarship tax credits. That's a mouthful. And we've built a coalition, building a coalition still, working with policymakers. We've got the policy down pat. We're working with parents, trying to find spokespeople and so forth. And it's a complicated, type of school choice program to explain to people. I'll just mention a, a, a few parts of it. But 17 states have adopted it. And in Georgia, they have a cap on these education scholarships of $58 million. And on January 1, they reached their cap. $58 million to, to help low-income students attend a private school with some scholarship money. We have four scholarship organizations here in our state that are 501c3 nonprofits. I donate to them. Many of you may donate to ACE, Seeds of Hope, Parents Challenge, Steve Sheck's group, or the Challenge Foundation. They have limited dollars. They have so much demand, but they can't meet the demand of all of the, all of the parents that are asking and begging them, please, please, we need help. We need options. We're on charter school lists, and we're not getting in. You know, the, the good schools are full. Help, help, please help. And um, so this type of program, it could bring in $58 million. It could be Colorado from donations from from corporations and individuals who donate to these organizations and then turn around and 
help families, empower families, give them a hand up, give them more choice. Now, um, we'll, we'll see what happens this year. Again, we've been working on this. A tax credit is more of an incentive than a, donation, a tax deduction, which is what you get now when you donate to those groups. And so we, uh, we think it would help a lot of kids. If you're interested in more information on that, I would love to talk to you later. Thank you. Brad? Yeah, thanks a lot. I should have asked to go first. I, about ha after she was done, halfway through her, I realized I'm eye candy or something. I'm <laughs> grateful to be here, but these guys, they're, they're the ones that, they're transforming education here and, and are very smart, and I'm not going to attempt to deal with the programmatic sorts of issues that they talk about, because I'm just not competent to. Um, we're going to talk about, you know, vouchers and common core and data privacy and maybe transgender bathrooms and those sorts of things. And I deal with that sort of stuff every day. I'm a lawyer. I work with schools and school districts. Um, but I'm equally interested in uh, addressing some issues that I think are opportunities within the system that um, will improve things for all kids. And I care a lot about my own kids. And as a Christian and as a citizen, you know, I think, in fact, I'm firmly convicted that I need to be equally about everybody else's kid. And just because I have the opportunity to put my kids in a choice opportunity, there's a lot of folks that don't. And, and so we need to influence the existing structure. And we can't just say, hey, no more government schools. We need to work within the system. Um, so a few years ago, in God's infinite wisdom or his sense of humor or what have you, I was selected to be the board attorney for Jeffco. And being where we're at, likely that's a familiar story to most of you. Uh, there was a uh, pretty big hubbub related to my hiring, to some issues about paying teachers based on the way they performed, amazingly. Um, we had a, a loud and sort of, uh, uh, well, just a very loud departure from the existing superintendent, so we had some transition issues. And, and it was a very difficult time. Um, it was exacerbated by a conflict around US, um, uh, AP US history. Uh, that became a national story. and. Uh, and it's all important stuff, but in a purple-ish type of district like this, I think there's a, a you know, it's an interesting story, and, it, and, and it, it, it informs us on a lot of issues. But I think a more important story occurred up north in uh, Loveland in, in Thompson School District. And, and I just want to tell you a little bit about that, that experience I had. Um, you know, it wasn't as overarchingly intense. I, I, I drove down Wadsworth. I just came up Wadsworth to get here because of traffic. And it reminded me of the time with my 12-year-old daughter. I drove up the street and watched, you know, people with signs telling my daughter that I was a horrible person. You know, there was a lot of anger and intensity here in Jeffco. I, I'm not discounting that. Um, and by the way, Julie back here, Julie Williams, wave. wave. What a hero. She and Ken Witt, Ken Witt from the board is here too. But... Julie had to endure having protesters in front of her house, I mean, and at her kid's school. And so, you know, my experience was nothing like that, and bless you. Um, but in Thompson, it, the, the election was intentional. People knew they were getting conservatives into the school board. And people in the community elected them intentionally, thinking we want to prioritize choice, you know, charter schools. We want to prioritize um, different ways of, of compensating, working with our teachers looking for better performance and improvement in the academics. There was an intentional um, election around that. Um, and fast forward, they effectively isolated and froze and mocked and uh, created strife and chaos. It, it's almost like those radicals had some sort of rule book. And, <laughs> and it, was, it was a difficult challenge. And remarkably, in a very red community, or a conservative or a Republican type of community, um, that board ultimately lost. And, and every gain from a reform perspective that they achieved, including ending the collective bargaining agreement, was erased immediately once that election in 2015 occurred. Um, and, and part of the, part of the th attack came in the form of social media. There was this website. I had such high hopes for it. It was called The Six Degrees of Brad Miller. And, and in the, f <laughs> the, f the first um, episode, it, um, it, it, it 
called out the shocking news that I'm related to my brother-in-law. And uh, <laughs> Paul Lundin is my brother-in-law. And, uh, and they claimed the Koch brothers had retained my services to control online education in Colorado. And I thought, this is going to be interesting. And then that one kind of died away. And the, in the less sexy um, Thompson School Board Reform Watch page, which still puts up little posts about Ross Izzard and Pam Benigno and that I know um, Deb Scheffel or something um, is, is, is still out there working actively, but they owned us in the area of social media. And, and, and so conservatives and Christians and people who were previously all about school choice um, were confused and, and, and ultimately they moved the folks out. Now, you know, in the, in the isolation, they, they made one person out to be a bully because he would raise his voice when there was disruption in the, in the boardroom. And, and there's some, you know, they had some great attacks on us. But um, it's, it's really striking when I think about that episode in, in Conservative Thompson and I think about what's going on in Douglas County. And, and it would be easy, um, sitting from where I sit, to, to be pretty despondent about the whole thing. Where are we going to go from here? We can't win these school board races anymore. What are we going to do? And I think, we, I think there's some approaches that we can adopt, and I think they'd be pretty effective. And I think groups like this ought to begin to consider and employ them. Um, we need to multiply, multiply, and then you know exponentially multiply the number of students in charter schools in Colorado. Uh, my kids go to a charter school, which is in Academy District 20. Academy District 20 is absolutely with you know it's one of the top three or four districts in terms of student performance in the state. It's safe, it's clean, it's exceptional, and yet at the Classical Academy there are 7,000 students on the wait list in Academy District 20. And, and so we need to expand. We need to go until there are no more wait lists. We need to move ahead. This will, it, this will inform our electorate, people that, there might be people here who don't quite understand that a charter school is a public school, that it doesn't take funding away from the district, that it doesn't have secret things that it can get away with that other public schools can't. There's a thing called the Innovation Schools Act. Any school in this state can get all the same waivers that a charter school gets. And, and so we need more people that are informed and by virtue of being involved in that community become charter school parents. And, and, and that will help change some things for us. Uh, there's people in this room, I talked with a couple prior to, to this meeting, that are, are all about designing ways to replicate. And, and if you know people that are mommies that need to start a new school because they're just not sure about their neighborhood school, we can facilitate that. There are ways to get that done. And one of the ways is to elect Deb Scheffel back to the State Board of Education. So she's really a lot smarter than me. She's really good at this. Do you, ha do you, ha so who here, raise your hand, raise your hand, raise your hand, everybody, is going to give her money tonight, okay? <laughs> do, you, do you have any cards or anything like that? I do in the back. If like to Alright, right, right there. You, Give her 10 bucks tonight. This is a big, big deal because the State Board of Education, from our perspective, hangs in the balance right now. She needs to get elected for it to maintain a posture of being positive around charter schools. We need more charter schools. I can't emphasize that enough. This is our way to continue moving forward. Um, the next thing I want to lightly address and, and look at, I'm renowned by the CEA as being some sort of evil Koch brothers puppet master, and it's not true. My kids love me, I'm a nice guy, but that's, that's my moniker, so to speak. Um, oh, I meant to tell you a joke. So, on Thompson, can I go back for a minute? So, so that the whole thing in Thompson was that I was a privatizing out-of-town attorney. So I was a privatizer. Actually, I think that's all right. You know, it's just like, yeah, we, we need less government schools. We need more competition. What happened with AT&T, you know, when we, we broke up that monopoly, and now I use AT&T because I got better because of that. I want the public schools to get better, and I think that competition helps. But I was the out-of-town privatizing attorney. They replaced me with an out-of-town law firm that charges $100 more per hour than I do. So... <laughs> I don't know. They got what they paid for, I guess. So um, I want to address, because I'm a Koch Brothers stooge, Jim, I'm sorry, but I, I want to address the fact that I think unions 
um, they serve their own purposes, but I don't believe that they serve the purpose um, and needs of the teachers who they ostensibly are supposed to be protecting. And so Paul Harold Lundeen back there, representative on the House Education Committee, previously the chair of the state board. Um, he had Carrie Dahlman, who was then CEA president, at a legislative hearing, and he asked her, um, is there a circumstance under which a more highly effective educator should be paid a higher wage? Her answer, I do not believe so. All teachers do the same job. So that perspective, I think, is demeaning to the constituency they're supposed to uh, support. And, and so I would advocate that we look into ways to um, to lessen the holds of collective bargaining agreements and, and give voice to that through school board meetings and, and attendance and writing emails to you know, Senator Lumberg and everybody, all, the, all this sort of activity really does count in that regard. The other thing is, without a collective bargaining agreement in a district, and I work with Falcon School District 49, which in my view is the most remarkable district in the state. They do, they're doing some incredible stuff. Um, and they're harnessing technology, and they're attentive to data privacy, they're doing some incredible things. And um, one of them is that they give teachers an opportunity to present micro um, proposals for micro innovations within the classroom. And I got to watch last fall when two teachers came in and proposed that they could have um, a whole cohort of 65 students. They would rent a modular that was right next to the middle school. And they would do soup to nuts education. And in return, they could be pa paid a the student funded proportion of PPR. So they got 80% of the students' money, and then out of that, they paid rental on the modular, they paid for curriculum, they paid for computers, they rented a PE teacher to help them out, and they, got to, they made a lot of money being able to be many, many entrepreneurs within the school system. That's a wonderful thing for teachers, and, and I want good teachers who are wanting that sort of thing to have those sort of opportunities. So, I think I had one more thing I wanted to ask, tell you about. No, one more. One of the things that I encounter working with charter schools, and I do work with a number of charter schools as their legal counsel, and so we're in a relationship with school districts, is uh, there's a remarkable lack of transparency on the school district side. And uh, as citizens, this, this is something we can be attentive to. Back, D49, we were the first ones back in 2007 to put all of our books online. We put our check registers online, and that led to Financial Transparency Act, and yet it is like, it's, it's just so difficult to get a Colorado Open Records Act request, um, you know, responded to by districts in, in terms of how are they spending their money at the central admin and these sorts of things. And this is a place where we can push as a citizenship, and we, and we can talk to our legislators about uh, those sorts of bills. Um, I'm so grateful to be here, Jeff. Thank you for this. Um, I want to also point out, uh, Tim Leonard, you need to... Uh, Reelect him as well. He's a good man and, and loves education. So thank you all. I would like to point out we are a 501c3 and don't endorse any particular candidate as much as we love you, Deb. <laughs> um, do you, what do conservatives need to do to work better with teachers? We mentioned getting parents more involved. You said that unions sometimes don't even represent teachers in the best way possible. Um, what do conservatives, and particularly conservatives in, on school boards, need to do to better work with teachers? Go ahead, Pam. Well, first of all, they need to listen, and they need to set up forums so that they can listen. listen. And I believe that if you're going to pass some reforms, that it's just not going to work unless you have the teacher's buy-in. And there are some people in this room I know that would disagree with me on that. But that's something I learned from Jerry Wartgo when he was the principal at DPS. <laughs> he, he, you know, they could pass things, but you can pass all you want, but if you want it to work, you got to have the teachers on board. I went to some fancy pants law school, and Everybody there, it, it seemed to me, had a similar mindset. They were all of the same ideological perspective, and I didn't share that perspective, and it felt very isolating. And uh, it wasn't until I ran into a group, it was called the Federalist Society, that I identified that, oh, there's people that think like me. 
And, and it gave me a niche and a place where I could safely, you know, <laughs> uh, university safe zones or whatever, but, uh, <laughs> but I was able to, um, you know, I, I gained confidence in that. In a similar way, there's an organization in our state called PACE, Professional Association of Colorado Educators. It's, it provides the same supports to teachers that unions do, but it doesn't take a lot of the funding and put it into legislative activities. And it's, and it's just, it's a great organization. It's very supportive. I've, I've seen their work and, and, and encouraging teachers to be involved in that sort of thing so they don't feel so isolated as, you know, fish out of water. Now my thought would be it's really the word respect. I think that um, we live in a very litigious society, and I think that teachers feel like they need the protection of CEA, for example, because they, they're concerned about behaviors that they could be dinged for in some way, and they feel like they need a strong entity to support them. So I think how can we work better with teachers, respect them, appreciate them. I know that the teachers I know work extremely hard. They are the ones that decide if they're going to stay late one day to make sure a kid gets on a bus. They're the ones that are going to figure out the schedule uh, in many cases and, and figure out how to individualize for kids that aren't getting it. And so I think the whole reform movement has somehow, in some respects, um, demonized teachers to some degree. And I think that that's really a big mistake because it's actually systemic in our system. There are systemic issues that render public education for some kids not particularly effective, which is why we need choice. But I think to focus that kind of ire on teachers is really the wrong focus point. I just say that as a teacher myself. Started out teaching and then began to teach in special education with kids that were struggling to learn. And I just think that um, respect and appreciation, you know, teachers love other people's children and it's not that easy. And so I just think that if we can communicate that and continue to, um, appreciate and respect teachers that yes the system needs reform and teachers will be the first ones to tell you that I work in schools all the time and they're the first ones to say our we don't even have a curriculum I'm writing curriculum at night I'm, I'm creating units out of thin air because our district doesn't have a curriculum now you know that's that means the teachers are working all day and all night too and uh, you know so things like that that teachers really kind of know what needs to be done uh, in the in many ways to make the system far better for more kids. So I guess I would say that is a really important aspect. If I may, yeah, so she generated something. In D49, my favorite school district, uh, we, we had a series of town halls with teachers um, orienting them around the idea that we could have, um, we could get innovation waivers, we could become schools of innovation in the district. And uh, frankly, I thought we were probably going to go in the direction of getting out of the Teacher Tenure Act or something like that, but the the things they came up with were just remarkably entrepreneurial and creative, and focused on making the kids' education so much better. and And they came out with some tremendous outcomes. I was just really proud of it. And it all came from sitting at the table with them, you know, having our board actually sit with them and and engage on idea creation, and that was fantastic. Um, what's happening in Douglas County right now? I mean, kind of help us understand the turmoil that's happening. We see a little bit in the newspapers, but um, what, what's kind of driving the, the issues down there? It's one of Colorado's largest counties, and imagine there's a lot of kids that are in those public schools, but in your mind, what's, what's happening down there? What needs to be done to kind of stabilize things? Probably all answer. of us could, yeah. It seems these days that any time there's a board, even in Douglas County now, that is controlled by reformers, that the other side knows how to be meaner than we do. And maybe we know how, we just don't want to be mean. And, and, and we try to be nice, and that's good, but we keep getting put into very uncomfortable positions. And sometimes we make mistakes. <laughs> sometimes we're not real quick to say, whoops, I goofed. <laughs> um, in Douglas County, uh, I'm assuming everybody knows what happened with the meeting with Grace Davis. Are you talking about that, the newest or, and latest? Or just the, 
we, there were three reformers that lost during the last cycle, I believe. Um, now there's all this kind of turmoil that's happening, I, I believe, around a meeting with a student yeah. that took mm -hmm. place. But mm -hmm. um, it seems bigger than that, than just a meeting with a student. I mean, what, what is, what's kind of driving these issues down there? You go ahead, Fred. Um, I'm being very careful on what I say. I'm not being <laughs> careful today for some reason. So um, I'm looking at Ken Witt here, who was the president of the Jeffco board when I was working with them. And uh, I think that his role was so isolated uh, when, he, when he was elected in, he, he, was, he didn't hide the ball. He, he told people what he was running on his platform and why he wanted to be there and what he wanted to accomplish. And he got m way more votes than whoever he was running against. And then those people, with the exception of a few friends I'm seeing in here, um, didn't come to meetings, didn't send us emails, didn't give us the attaboys. And as a result, um, I'll shift now to, to Thompson. In, in that same environment, our board members would become a little bit uh, f uh, fragmented. And, and, and because we're all based on principles and values, and, and you know, we, we move in our own direction, um, sometimes the folks that are against us move sort of in a coordinated big posse. And, and it would be very, very helpful to have everybody in this room send an attaboy or, or show up at a meeting of, of a school board. That would make a tremendous difference in Douglas County right now. And I would just say that I, I, don't, I don't know the, the real details of what's happening in Douglas as much as some others may, but what I do know is that a lot of parents who have kids in public schools really like their children's teachers. And sometimes if the messaging gets off, um, you lose the confidence of the public. And I think that perhaps in the last election, some of that went on. I think the, mes the way things were messaged, um, of course, that got a lot of visibility. And I think that the public also, the idea is that people don't like constant turmoil and anxiety. And when you have constant negativity, the public gets tired of it and feels like, you know what? I like my child's teacher. My child goes to this local school. And I, I want the, 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 um, the contentiousness to smooth out. Because you can't maintain that level of, of acrimony for very long without just getting tired of it. So I think really this is a messaging issue and it needs to be a, an advocacy issue for teachers, for parents, for the best opportunities and options and choices possible. And I think sometimes the negativity gets out of control and it's hard for people to want to continue that. As human beings, we seek equilibrium and peace. And over time, you know, we don't want to maintain that level uh, of acrimony. Deborah, on the statewide question, um, or statewide issues, what are, what's one of the biggest priorities that you're gonna be facing this upcoming year, and we're gonna be going into session, you know, in a few months from now? What are some of the biggest issues you all are facing as State Board of Education? I think turnaround schools are a big issue. Uh, we know that there are a number of schools across various districts in the state that are on in the fifth year of the five-year clock, which means they have intractably low data and poor growth in terms of achievement over time. And that puts influence in the hands of the state board to do something about it based on the premise that we don't want kids in these intractably low-performing schools continuously. We want to do something about it and pr create some pressure so that districts will make differences because, you know, kids only get one shot at third grade or fifth grade or ninth grade. And when you have schools that just seem to not be able to get out of uh, flat growth or achievement levels that are just not acceptable, then what do we do as a state? Do we let that continue? Do we push that to just the local district to address? And because of the laws in Colorado, the state board has given influence over over making decisions about those schools. Personally, I feel like those decisions should be made more locally by parents. If you look at the kids who are in turnaround schools or priority improvement schools and the schools are shut down or there's some draconian um, decision that's made to, to impact that school, then you track those kids, let's say in the case of a school being closed, and are they doing better in a new school? Sometimes not, often not. And, and so I, I don't know that that the power should be centralized with the state board on those kinds of decisions, which really are community decisions. You go into any community where they've closed schools, people are very upset because people have a, an attachment to local neighborhood schools. And so yet we have to be supportive to try to figure out what is the root cause of 
intractably low achievement. I mean, as we said, kids don't get a second chance at third or fifth or ninth grade. They have one shot. And it says that it, the research suggests that it takes, um, is it like three years to get over one year of a poor experience? So it's very hard for kids to recover from some of that. So I think that's a real big issue because we are a local control state, yet we have laws that centralize some of these decisions, uh, ostensibly they're for the good of the kids and the schools and the parents. On the other hand, sometimes the unintended consequences don't always end up like we'd hoped. So I'm concerned about how that's going to work because I, I want to make sure that parents and communities are heavily invested and involved in those decisions. Pam, do you want to speak in into any big statewide issues coming up this year? Well, for me, it would be school choice. <laughs> so, I, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that there'll be legislation this year to expand school choice. Uh, again, the type of program that I briefly described earlier. The important thing, though, here, too, is it needs to be bipartisan support. Even if the Republicans are in control, and they won't be total control, we know that, uh, it, school choice programs need to have Democrats and Republicans on board to be successful because many, for one reason, a lot of the communities that will mostly benefit from these kinds of programs are filled with Democrats and Democrat leaders. And so that's very, very important. I think there's a danger when, uh, and I, I'm a, I'll take my Independence Institute hat off for a minute. I've been a active Republican for a long time, not so much in the last few years, but certainly way in the past. And uh, sometimes Republicans and probably Democrats too, they, they don't want the other side involved because they want all the credit so that then they can say that, look what we passed. But that's a, this is the kind of program where we need to come together. Um, Governor Romer, whoops, if I can get on my soapbox real quick. There's a flyer uh, um, advertising this paper out on the table if there are any left. Uh, on the road of innovation, Colorado's charter school law turns 20. I interviewed everybody, almost everybody involved at the time of the charter school law, the important players. And uh, one of the things that's so exciting is how the Democrats and the Republicans came together. If it wasn't for Roy Romer, who he was governor at the time, it wouldn't have passed. It may have passed later, but it, it wouldn't have passed then. And so Republicans and Democrats can work together uh, and improve education for kids. But we've got to allow them, we've got to allow that to happen. Oh, go ahead, Deb. Yeah. I could add another one, and maybe Brad would speak to this, but it's the whole issue of data privacy. And it's great that Representative Lundeen's in the room with the passage this year of House Bill 16 1423, which is lauded as the most um, aggressive data privacy bill in the nation. Uh, implementing that will be, I think, a good step in the right direction to protecting kids' personally identifiable inst uh, information. We know that we have a P20 system, and we have a lot of data points, way too many in my, in my view. And the question is, how do we protect that and the sharing of that information so as not to um, end up tracking and bucketing kids so that their opportunities are somehow truncated by these data? And also um, to ensure that those data aren't sold, not shared without parental p permission and consent. So it's such an important bill, and there are many legal intricacies, and I didn't know if Brad wanted to speak to that. <laughs> <laughs> All these yeah, legal intric intricacies, I don't know about that. I, I, I had another thing, but yeah. maybe you've got other questions. I okay. want to keep Two this. Two more questions, and then we'll turn it over, but go ahead, please. I wanted to say, look, first, I don't like new, any new legislation. We should just, you know, have those guys work for a week or two and then be done for the year. But the, um, but I, I do see some um, fertile ground in the area of our rural school districts who are facing enormous challenges with, like, getting licensed teachers, meeting all the regulatory obligations. Jason, do you have any regulatory obligations at AVA that you need to deal with? I mean, charter schools and rurals have to basically hire a, a full-time, you know, equivalent to to meet the federal and state and, 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 and CDE regulations. There's some opportunity with the rurals to um, impact that, and I'm looking forward to seeing what, how that um, develops this year. I think that would be a big push. Great. I was meeting with some uh, superintendents over the weekend. This gentleman said that they have like 87 reports to write every year. And it's just oppressive. And so some would say that um, regulation is the path to reform. In, a, in another sense, it, it isn't. 
And so that level of regulatory burden really takes away from what a leader can do for innovation in the school, and it really takes away from time that could be spent on instructional excellence. And so that level of, uh, of regulation, I think, is very difficult to function within and still be committed to quality. Two last questions and we'll turn it over. Uh, if you looked at the comments on this event, there's a lot of negativity around Common Core. Um, what's the future of Common Core in Colorado? Ask her. <laughs> <laughs> so Common Core was, um, came into Colorado in 2009, 2010. I actually was on some of the, uh, one of the committees f to write the reading, writing, and communication standards when I worked at the Department of Education. And there were meetings all across the state to develop these standards and engaging teachers and a number of, just a lot of entities. Um, after that, the uh, Race to the Top money was released and so it incentivized states to adopt Common Core standards. And so Colorado ended up doing a crosswalk between the standards that had been developed at the state level and then the Common Core standards that had been developed with state input, but also with a lot of interest groups centrally at the federal level. And so because the sense was there's not that big a difference between what the state had developed and the Common Core standards, and we are incentivized to receive these funds through Race to the Top, why don't we just adopt the Common Core standards? Which the state board did. I was not on the board at that time, and it won on a 4-3 vote. And since then, we've had the, the Common Core standards. Of course, we call them the Colorado Academic Standards, and 85% of them are centrally written, and the copyright rests with um, the the entities that developed it, and then Colorado can add 15% distinctives, which, which we did. So the question is, what do we do about that? Well, we're now in the year that we're beginning to review the standards again. So we really are at a kind of a crossroads to determine, are we going to continue that relationship with Common Core, or are we going to have a whole new process to develop a new set of standards? Kind of two sides to that. I would say, having seen Common Core uh, implemented in schools, I, I don't think it's a path to excellence for Colorado. I think that uh, for some schools it may raise the bar, for others it may actually lower the bar. <laughs> and I actually talked to a middle school teacher recently, I always love to talk to the teachers, how does it really work for you? And she was a middle school math teacher and actually said, you know, I really think the Common Core is actually a little more rigorous than what we had before. Uh, but generally speaking, as I see it implement, I don't think it's the role of, of, of special interest groups and national entities to develop standards for Colorado. I think we need to do that at a state level. Uh, because it opens the paths of influence from groups that may have an, uh, an agenda or, or a specific penchant for certain kinds of content. And we really want to do that at the state level, right? We don't really want other folks holding a copyright on our standards, even though it's 85% of them. So what is the future of Common Core? We need to decide as a state what we're going to do, how we're going to go forward. Are we going to uncouple from Common Core and completely rewrite? Are we going to make it an option and say, hey, you've been implementing this for five years. If you like it, continue to do so. That's a local district um, decision. And standards should be guardrails. They shouldn't be very specific and precise because they need to meet the values and the priorities of the district. And so I, my sense is that the state board will be having very rigorous conversations about that. My sense is that we're a local control state and I think for us to be coupled with Common Core, uh, given that we don't own the copyright, we can't make changes to it, they can make changes to it, and we, we can't really influence that. It makes sense for us to do this work as a state and as districts. All right, last question. Uh, Technology is changing, a lot of schools going online. There's probably a, people in here aren't aware that you can even go to a public school online the entire time. How is that changing education in Colorado? How are online schools making a difference? So overall, online schools are not performing as well academically as, as traditional brick and mortar schools. And, and there's several reasons for that. Uh, some is historical. There were some providers that were um, early into the market who weren't held rigorously accountable to standards as they came in and became charter schools or service providers to school districts and so forth. And, and frankly, they just didn't do a great job. Uh, then, um, the other thing is a lot of these schools attract the sort of students that don't fit in well into the traditional schools. And so I work with, a, uh, with D49, we work with Goal Academy, and they're what's known as an AEC, Alternative Education Campus. And I've watched their graduations. I watched their, their 
their beginning days, and, and a significant number of students there are young mothers or young pregnant girls. They're kids with parents who are imprisoned or not around. You know, they, they're very hard luck students. And so I'm, I'm very enthused about the opportunity that online education gives those folks. And, and to that end, my daughter, who was a professional dancer at a young age, um, entered into an online program, and it was, it was the bee's knees. It was, just, it was just right for her, and, and, and she had an exceptional education all the way into high school where she trans, transitioned out. So I began something called the Colorado Digital BOCES, which is an alternative authorizer to work with online schools, and we now operate four schools, or the BOCES operates four schools, all of which are held to far higher standards than a normal charter school, and certainly more than a normal online school. And I, I th so I think that's part of the future, is holding them more accountable. The other part is uh, digital, you know, digital content, if you devise it into um, an interaction in a blended way where you're working hand in glove with your schools, you know, it can just be so tremendous. And so um, my favorite school district is D49. And <laughs> we have actually, um, student backpacked all of the funding to such a granular degree that if a kid in one of our, our um, charter schools wants to take AP classes at one of our traditional brick and mortars, she can do that. And then she can take online courses with the, one of the online providers, and she can do that. And we, we let her separate her bank account for education. And I think that's a big part of the future is we're going to see kids choose their own pathways. And, and to their credit, they're giving opportunities at the state board for us to explore those options. I think there's a bright future in all of this. Right. Yes, Pam. I was on the board of a charter, one of those earlier, early and large online schools, and I was so excited because I loved the curriculum. I thought this is going to be fantastic, and I was so disappointed. Uh, you know, you just like with. Um, all schools, whether it's a private school, home school, online school, did I say private, public, charter, which are public schools, mm -hmm. you can't legislate high expectations in the classroom. And that's what it really all comes down to. So I saw moms that were doing school, online, public schools, and they did an excellent job, an excellent job. Same with homeschoolers. I've seen homeschoolers that did a great job, and maybe, maybe you've seen some that, that mm -hmm. haven't. So, you know, it goes both ways. I've seen it in private schools, charter schools, and traditional public schools. The online situation gave um, an awful lot of freedom and nobody around to see really what was going on. Um, glad to hear there's more accountability that's good. I, I, I'm hopeful for blended learning. We ended agreements with two providers because they didn't meet our standards already within three years. I mean, so we're holding them accountable, and, and it's meaningful. That's great. That's great because the families deserve that. They don't know what they're getting into a lot of times. It is the last resort for some families, and they, they, uh, they go into that, and then, wow, if their kid didn't do work at the traditional school, they're not going to do any work in the online school. Mm -hmm. Right. Can I make a comment? Yes, then. So I think there's like 42 online schools in Colorado of about 1,800 and growing. And I think one of the benefits of online education is that it can provide individualization, which is what Brad and, and Pam have shared. I know I talked to a high school student recently who had failed her freshman, sophomore, and junior year of high school, which is devastating. And I was encouraging her to try out an online school where they it was a blended model where she could go to a learning center, but also quickly get into the system, get assessed, figure out exactly where she stood in the major subjects, and then begin to move through these modules. If she were in a traditional high school, I think that it would be very difficult for her to ever catch up. So I think these schools really do uh, serve an important service. I think the, the, the other side of that is that online education cannot replace teachers. And you can think about it as an individual yourself. If you're trying to learn something new, and you get on the internet, and there's a module there, you can move through it and probably 
maybe score 80% or something on, on questions that might be part of that module, but you can walk away still having a very shallow sense of what you're trying to learn. And that's because education is always a discourse. It's always back and forth where you're constraining meaning and trying to figure out examples and how it would apply. And if this is true, what would be the converse of that? And what's a good example of it? A host of issues that if you're getting a good education, you're asking those questions of a of subject matter expert and they're able to answer it. And so, you know, we've all taken multiple choice tests and done well and walked away thinking, I hope nobody asks me to actually do this, <laughs> even though I've answered these questions correctly. And so really, like anything, this is about how good it is. But I really think blended models have far more, uh, I think they have a lot to offer just because they can incorporate that human element. We have to remember that, you know, teaching is always a personal uh, enterprise and you can't machine it and you can't, um, constrain it by small metrics and, and data points. You can do that, but it will, the sum it will always be uh, greater than the parts. Okay, so I think that's what I would say about online education. I really support it as an option, but not alone and not for all kids, and certainly having the human element inside of it is essential. Great. Uh, we'll open it now, now to questions, and Ashton Belk has a microphone. Ms. Janine McKenzie. <laughs> I have two questions about yes. the interim superintendent of the interim commissioner. Can you tell us about uh, two of the new hires and what you're looking for in a regular? When will that be uh, appointed as a regular commissioner? And then also, um, uh, you have a new hire uh, that is doing the Office of Strategic Partnerships with community based and businesses. Can you tell us a little bit about that and that hire for the Department of Ed? Well, so one of the um, tasks of the state board is to hire a commissioner for the state. As we said, there's 178 districts and the commissioner uh, works for the board and is, is hired by the board, but he or she uh, plays an important role in leadership and, and other important tasks in the state. Uh, we uh, have an interim commissioner right now, Dr. Katie Anthes. She's been at the department, uh, I don't know the exact number of years, but for a time, and is trusted. I think she has a good relationship with the, sup with the um, superintendents of the districts. I think we needed an interim that would uh, be a good manager, keep things stable, be um, work well with the superintendents, and I think that um, she's a, a good person in that respect. I was up at the uh, conference recently at Case uh, in Breckenridge, and she was there and gave a really great talk and had a lot of support. So I think we're at a point in our state where we need that level of stability. Uh, probably a new commissioner won't be hired until uh, after November. Uh, because the complexion of the board, uh, you know, numbers of people are up for election, so we're trying to figure out what would the complexion of the board be and what would be the best uh, for Colorado in terms of leadership at the commissioner level. Uh, as far as new hires, I don't know that I can speak to that with detail uh, because I think a lot of the hires are kind of being put off until after a, a full-time commissioner is hired, but there have been some hires just because there's just a lot of work at the Department of Education. Uh, there are like 550 FTE at CDE, Colorado Department of Education, and just a host of initiatives, and they're by statute. And so there's not a lot of uh, latitude in terms of getting certain things filed and getting, getting certain things done by deadlines. So those new hires relate to getting that work done, and I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Thank you. Got a question over here? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Hi, uh, my name. Hi, my name's Tom Munson. I, uh, I've had, had conversations with a uh, school superintendent in a lo not at Denver Public School, but a local school, and their problem, he, th he said, was uh, the incentives getting kids because they come from families that, you know, in many cases single f single moms, in many cases homeless, and. And in, in light of that, a lot of kids that go to charter schools, and from my experience, seems to be they come from motivated, you know, families who are motivated for improving their education. So, what incentives can you create for kids that don't come from families that are that view education as important? And so, you're dealing with truancy issues, and you're dealing with incentives. Uh, what what's going to make that kid work hard for 12 years to get through school? Are there some things that are out there that you can deal with? 
Um, I, I'd have, be happy to speak to that. <clears throat> there are some charter school networks in Denver Public Schools that are being very successful with low-income students. My daughter so happens to work at one that is probably one of the lowest income areas. And from what she's told me, it's a pretty amazing place. And they're offering these students um, safety and a culture of I believe in you and I'm going to help you through this. Because they're a charter school, they have less regulation and they're, they're able to do things. Let's see, how did she put it? We're able to do what we need to do to be able to help that, you know, those students. She's in special education in high school. She'll have kids coming in, 11th graders, that read at the second grade level. It's pretty tough. It's pretty tough. Now, uh, that's not because they're low income. That's, you know, every school has a certain amount of special ed students. These kids are coming from some pretty, pretty um, difficult situations. And from what I gather from listening to my daughter, uh, it's, it's just a wonderful environment for them. They probably have to offer more structure. And I've seen that at some of the other DPS, charter school network schools, where there's lots and lots and lots of structure, where a child that comes from a family that provides a lot of support uh, may not need quite so much structure because they've been raised to understand that and, and do those things on their own. So they, they are being successful. And, and uh, um, I, again, go back to the expectations in the classroom is so, so important. So um, kids are either coming from a home. I mean, some of our Academy 20 school district, for instance, great school district, but Probably the majority of those kids are coming from homes that are pretty supportive, and their parents value education. They've provided them with lots of experiences. And that has something to do with the school district. I'm not saying it's not good. It's, it's a great school district, but they've got a lot going for them in that way. You take kids that don't have those same advantages and you're successful with them, then you know you're, you're really in a good school. I'd like to add that um so there was a report just came out. Charter schools do not disproportionately serve, you know, certain populations. They they are first come first serve. Even if they use a lottery, they don't have priorities that will give someone with means a, a better chance in. And they don't exclude on the basis of special education needs or, or these other sorts of challenges. So uh, you know, their their special education statistics are generally in the same vicinity. Their ELL and all of these sorts of FRLL FRL statistics are fairly comparable with the, with the state at large. So they're not exclusionary. And for example, a, a district like Denver Public Schools has, I think, over 50 charter schools. So there are um, districts that really try to provide a lot of choice for parents. And I think as far as getting them engaged, it's a matter of them in, inviting them in. And so the schools have to take the initiative, I think, for that. And that's why quality teachers are so important, because some of the teachers I know, just the force of their personage their commitment to helping kids develop a rich mind life, their excitement with learning and enthusiasm is contagious for kids. And that's why we have to have teachers that are respected and highly committed to this work. And then we have to have districts that know that sometimes parents don't know that they can get engaged, don't know that they're welcome in a kid's child's classroom. I had talked to a parent recently who said, I didn't really know that I could just ask to come into my child's third grade class and just see how it goes <laughs> you know and as, as the kids get older they feel less and less welcome in the schools and so i think the districts and the schools themselves and the leadership have the responsibility to welcome the parents in they're paying taxes for these services for their children and then secondly just great teachers that are enthusiastic about learning right i believe the yes okay question over here yes Brenda. do we have any vocational high schools in denver or in Colorado? Good question. There are two new ones opening up this fall, one in the best school district in Colorado. <laughs> and <laughs> and, uh, it, and it's a charter, and it is uh, with the James Irwin Charter School Network, which serves 65% FRL students in its K through 12 network, and it is going to be vocational, very vocational in orientation. And there's another up 
FRL is, I'm sorry. Uh, free and reduced lunch. So th okay. the, the demographic in terms of, you know, um, uh, money. But uh, there, there's another one, I want to say St. Vrain, but I think I might be wrong. But there's two opening up this year and more in the pipeline. Right. And um, if you go to schoolchoiceforkids.org, we're launching our new site tomorrow. I don't know that we have those two schools in there yet, but you can search for vocational schools through Sch that website. Schoolchoiceforkids.com? Yeah. Dot org. Dot org. There, there are little bookmarks, cute little bookmarks in the back when you go out. <laughs> Great. Yes, ma'am. No. Oh, there. sorry. Oh, sorry. The man, the man you, you've gone up and down Thanks. a few times. Thanks. Go Thanks. ahead. Yeah. <laughs> um, Andrew and Dean, uh, great event. Um, uh, Dean Shuffle, you've mentioned a couple times the, the teachers, and I think um, something that, this, that the education reform movement often forgets is the teachers. And in my mind, um, a successful education reform movement needs the students, the teachers, or the parents and the teachers. How do we get the teachers on our team? Well, I think as I was saying, it's, I think teachers need, I mean, these are sort of uh, ambiguous concepts, right? But all of us probably work and are in a vocation and how many of us want to be in a vocation and in a job where when we walk in the door we feel like we're not respected or that we don't have a lot of options as to being decision makers in in how we run our classrooms I mean we 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 have really regulated education exponentially in the name of raising achievement raising scores and we've kind of left the people that implement all of that behind at times and so how do we get teachers quote on our side I guess I would say we need to have a system that appreciates teachers' professionalism, respects them for the training they've received, incentivizes them to do the very best work they can, does great professional development to equip them to serve the needs of their students. We have over 100 languages spoken in Aurora, for example. How well, what kind of professional development do we give to teachers mm -hmm. to help them prepare those students to take a test that in part determines their ability to continue working at that school. I mean, it's almost an, an, a lose-lose situation because they're there because they want to teach. They're there for altruistic reasons. They care about learning, and yet they're given a, a deck of cards, so to speak, that has very great challenges. And so how to get teachers to really engage, respect, tools for performance and success, um, the ability to make decisions. Most of the teachers I talk to when I go into their classrooms, which I do all the time, and we talk about what would you do better if you could? What kind of resources do you feel like you need? Uh, they usually know. And so a lot of this top-down regulation, I think, though done with good intent and in the name of trying to make things better, sometimes hasn't achieved those end results. So I think we have to look carefully about what are leverage points that create change in a very large entity with many moving parts I think that's a great question for us to ask. Great. Some questions back here, or, uh, sorry, yes, yes, ma'am. Thanks. I'm Jill Cullis, and I'm a teacher in Aurora Public Schools. Um, I am a conservative uh, teacher in high school. I teach social studies. I'm not a freak of nature. I'm just a rare breed uh, is social studies. But um, I would like to ask, um, one of our issues as an educator, and first of all, I want to totally thank um, Deb. She totally gets it of where we're coming from. I teach those 100 different languages in US history at the high school level, because I teach sheltered US history. So those are the kids that I teach, and it is an incredible challenge to do that. And I just applaud Deb because because she really gets it as a teacher. So I do, a couple, I do have a question, but I just want to applaud your question back here. That was excellent. How do we get, how do we engage the teachers? How do we get them on our side? And I'm a huge supporter of, of PACE. I'm a member of PACE and a huge recruiter from PACE. When was the last time you guys were in a classroom? Whether you're a grandparent or as a volunteer, when was the last time you spent one day a month going into your grandkids' classrooms, going into your neighborhood classroom to volunteer? to see what it's like in the trenches. I love my job. This is my 30th year. I start my first day of class tomorrow. I love my job. I'm very blessed by that. But what can you do to, to support your teachers? Get to know your teacher, just like how do I engage my students? I need to know my students. I need to know the homes that they come from. 
When was the last time you spent time in the classroom in volunteering, reading to kids at every level, in special ed, in ELA classes? So I would challenge you guys, how do you get teachers on your side? You get to know those teachers in your community and go sit in their classroom and work with kids and help support them as a community member. So that was my, sorry, that was a little bit more of a spiel than, than anything. But I want to ask, one of my pet peeves is the fact that we sweat the standardized tests because my job depends upon it. Kids sleep during the test because they don't. It doesn't mean anything to kids. There is zero reason that a child should even show up to take the test. Mm. We actually went, our principals actually were driving the little short buses, going to kids' homes to get kids to come to at least sign in to get the test. Mm. And all the kid would do is hit next, 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 because there's zero accountability from the student's perspective. What are the carrot mm. and the stick approaches for getting kids to be, to come to school that it means something to them it kills us and we're sweating and we're like, oh my God, we're doing, you know, we got all kinds of dog and pony shows as teachers and administrators to get kids to show up and, hey, we got the test, let's go, let's put it, you know, but there's zero accountability for the students. What do we need to do policy-wise, legislative-wise to get kids to be held accountable for what they do on the test? Great question. So I just comment on that. My thought would be that it's no surprise that kids are not motivated to take these tests because most even adults don't like to take tests. <laughs> you know, I mean, I was talking to a, a gal who's graduated college and trying to take the GRE and she's dreading the GRE because she says she doesn't test well. And so to think that we're going to incentivize children, I've seen a lot of districts try to do various things, field trips and all kinds of pep rallies <laughs> and all kinds of things to try to create excitement about the test. I think it's a very hard sell for kids. And I think that when we rendered education the kind of things we can test, I think we denigrated education. Because you can't test the richness of education per se. I think teachers need data for testing and, and they have curriculum-based assessments and all kinds of assessments that are helpful in guiding instructional decisions. But to make it a high-stakes test where you, we're exceeding the federal minimums in Colorado, where we're spending a lot of time testing uh, from the teachers I talk to, they begin in late February and they don't end till May. And a lot of the, uh, the technology labs are taken up with using the computers. Uh, I, I've stood in rooms with kids taking these tests and seen the tears, and it doesn't happen all the time, of course. Some kids do okay on it. But, you know, it, it's a very um, difficult process for many children and adolescents. And I think the root issue underneath that is do we want to render education the things we can test? Because that's what we're saying when we tie high stakes decisions to how kids perform on those tests. So I think we need to relook at why we're testing, how the state, wh wh who needs that data? How are they using those data? And what can we do to return education to developing a rich mind life for children, creating the conditions for cognitive change and development for the children in this nation and for the next generation. I think that's what education is. One of the things I'm concerned about is the money spent on the testing. It's very expensive. The Pearson uh, rep was at a school one day. On, my name's Sandy Nations, and I teach here at Colorado Christian University, and I teach teachers how to be teachers in the alternative licensure program. And I was 32 years in the English classroom at Golden High School, so I've paid a lot of, I, I understand what goes on in the classroom. And I volunteer in my grandchildren's classrooms as well. But the, I have a friend that I go to church with and she said that the Pearson rep laughed at her and said that I don't know how you, how you do it. I don't know why you stay teaching because um, we have, um, we, it's like we have a funnel of money coming into Pearson because we provide the training for the teachers, we tie the test, we grade the test, we do all this stuff, and it just the money just comes right into the Pearson Corporation, and there's no money to build buildings, and no money to pay teachers, and no money to make repairs, no money. And it seems ridiculous to me. And my friend, she said, I made a list of all of the things I could not do this year because I had to do testing. All of the things that were rich in my classroom because of the testing, and it's, unconscionable as it's an a, educator to look at that. Yeah, I think it's a great point. It's a lucrative business to write and score and 
makeup tests and so forth f in the assessment business. I think we can have accountability as a state and for parents and for kids without the kind of testing we do and with the, uh, the frequency of it. I don't think we need to do that to get the kind of data we need for accountability for the public. One last question. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, my name is William Windler. And just a, uh, an observation and a question. The observation has to do with the academic content standards and also, uh, I guess they're called Common Core now. Uh, we live in an era of significant uh, mobility. I mean, kids are moving constantly. Families are moving you know, all over the place, all over the country and districts within, within the state. So doesn't it make some kind of sense to have at least some set of common standards to be available for kids regardless of where they move? so that there's some continuity in their education. So that, that was just an observation, because it seems to me that we want to have standards, standards that not only teach us to be Coloradans, but also to be Americans. So those standards need to affect uh, American values and standards as well for mobility purposes. And the second, uh, the, the actual question that I have has to do with the schools that are in turnaround status, particularly those that have been there four or five years now. And from what I've been able to understand, most of them are choosing the innovation school methodology in order to uh, get out of the turnaround process. So my question is, how long is it appropriate to allow schools to remain in the innovation cycle, if you will, and after they're in it for five years, is it appropriate to approve innovation status again? Or if the goal is to really provide more choice and educational opportunities for communities and, 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 and students in particular, isn't it time to cause these schools to become charter schools and to provide more choice and opportunity now versus losing another generation of students? Thanks. I, I want to, if I can ask. Bill and Denise are both, their stories are included in this story, story here. Uh, Jim Griffin once told me that um, audio? Audio I turn it off there, there I go, go. Okay. once Jim Griffin and who was the head of the League of Charter Schools for a long long time we were having a discussion back when Cole Middle School was forced into the first school that the state closed and Jim made a really good point and that is that charter schools uh, are successful maybe mostly I don't remember if he said partially or mostly because it's an organic movement. It's, a, it's parents, community members who really want this school, and they're willing to sacrifice. I mean, you should hear some of the stories. Ross is gonna write about some of them next year. Um, what parents do to, open, to help open these schools, cleaning the toilets, painting the walls, doing the construction up until the day the school opens. Uh, so when you don't have that organic support, hmm. Bill, and you close the school down and you say, okay, now you're a charter school, and the school fails, let's say, because the parents didn't really want it, didn't want to take the responsibility, then possibly you're, you're hurting, I hate to go to test scores, but you know that lump of charter schools and that, that bad apple ends up maybe hurting the rest of them. But, but my real question to you would be, do you think that works? And he's an expert <laughs> on charter schools. Do you think that would work for the state to be closing down a school and making it a charter school? I, I firmly believe that uh, students, particularly parents, can find themselves trapped in the
failing. That, that they were sick and tired of their kids failing. What can we do in order to not have our kids fail? And they all came together. And when No Child Left Behind was passed, it was because the National Hispanic Caucus, the National Black Caucuses, all of the minority groups came, came together behind George Bush in a nonpartisan manner in order to provide a program so that no child would be left behind. And I think that the big thing behind that was the disaggregation of data by race, ethnicity, sex, handicapping condition because it blew away the opportunity for large affluent districts to uh, put a light on everything is fine, you know, because the, the aggregate data allowed that to happen. But now, whole different discussions are happening all around the country because of the disaggregation of data. And minority communities in particular, and there are very few minorities here, unfortunately, they understand this. They, they, they have a gut feeling they want their kids to achieve. So how are we going to help them achieve? How are we going to educate them and, and, and be passionate in helping them find an opportunity out of this disastrous situation that goes on from generation to generation. And I've been thinking about this 30 years and it's always the same discussion, the same stuff, nothing ever changes. Mm -hmm. And something has to change, thanks. I'm just sitting here as the eye candy, so I'm not an educator, but I'm a big fan of disruptive change and I think that that transition to charter schools when you have a long-term failing innovation school or public school is, is the better route. That's me, and I'm not going to let her talk to it because she's on the state board. <laughs> well, that wraps up our time. I want to just kind of review some of the main topics. I think those of us who are lay people, eye candy, as Brad would say, <laughs> um, can walk away with. One, parents need to have choice and parents need to be involved. Two is that we need to listen to teachers better we need to provide standards that are guidelines and not micromanage our teachers. We need to be able to free up teachers to do what they need to do. I think that's what you said, Pam. Um, we need to provide backpack funding, make sure that we're really putting it um, for each individual student and allows them to have the maximum amount of choice with the blended learning side. And then finally, most important is local control and getting back to that issue and, and really kind of giving um, particular communities the, the, the control that they need to create the schools they want to create. So please join me in uh, thanking, the, thanking our uh, panelists.